There we go. So I reside on the other side of Albany, New York from Kevin Kenny. I'm in Averill Park. Okay. The goal statement right at the top of our wiki page is to create the world's most universal, detailed, and out-of-date map. This is actually a lot easier than you would think because there are not a lot of people putting energy into producing detailed, universal, out-of-date maps right now. So we can be pretty empty and still be the best at whatever it is we think we're doing. The reality of OHM is there's a lot of blank space. There's a, enough of history after all, but there are some really detailed areas in the map. So we're gonna show you some of them tonight. One thing to go find on our wiki page is the projects under open historical map, and that'll give you a sample of things people have been working on and chosen to document. I particular want to point at the bottom of the projects page where we see proposed projects and potential projects. Those are things that are really kind of looking for people to jump in. So if you are interested in OHM and aren't sure what you want to do, you should basically talk to us, look at the project page and you know, see what you want to do. What in OHM is the same as OSM? Well, we use the exact same database schema, the exact same editing API. That means that we have the exact same editors. There's a fork of ID uh, for OHM that's identical to the one for OSM. And the only thing we do in the fork is change where the editor points. It's very easy to configure your copy of JOSM to talk to OHM instead of OSM and their instructions on the wiki. We have our own instance of overpass, which is completely unmodified. So it basically does all the overpass things you would expect and OSM tagging is pretty relevant. We have not changed it really, although we may interpret things in interesting ways, but there's a lot of merit in having our tagging be the same as OSM to, to the extent that it can be. So what are the things that are different? Well, if any of you have watched a discussion of what kinds of historical things are okay to map in open street map, you've probably gotten really tired of them. Um, in OHM, mapping things that no longer exist is encouraged. Now it's not open fiction map. If you, they should be things that have existed, but you know, if there are no traces of it, that's okay. Um, we have a mixed licensing model. There's a license tag that we use. We encourage CC0, which is in effect a public domain. CC by, SA is okay. We discourage copying from OSM unless you have explicit permission from the mapper because otherwise all kinds of things get triggered by the ODB, o o ODBL that us out of things quite frankly. So yeah, we tell people not to just pull stuff and move it over. We have start date and end date tags. These actually exist in OSM but are only used by some mappers. They're important in OHM because they're part of knowing what part of history something is in. We also want people to be very careful about sourcing. I know you can't just go out, drive around on the road, take pictures, make a GPS track, maybe look at Bing and declare yourself done. We're, we are behaving like we're public historians and so we need to behave like historians and actually pay attention to what we're doing. And we encourage people doing projects to create a project page in the wiki to describe what they're doing and where it is in the map. Now, another thing that's very different, and this just happened with the recent reconstruction of the site of the first few months of this year, is that we switched over to a vector, vector tile renderer with a time slider at the bottom. And the time slider uses a start and end date to determine what it's going to show you. So right, that right there is a good reason why you should be figuring out what the actual dates are on things. And thanks to Jeff for being the spark plug behind Time Slider. It's been a long time coming. We've been talking about it for years and now suddenly it's there. And I can tell you it's a huge motivator to start actually working on OHM is getting to watch the Time Slider work on your stuff. Now for start date and end date, right now we just support ISO date formats. 
There will be extensions in the future because there are all kinds of cases that ISO date is not going to handle. ISO dates in their current form don't really do uncertainty. And if you want to be really picky, they only go back to the 1500s because they're in Gregorian time and not Julian. So expect extensions to that in the future. And now it's time for um, Nathan to do his time slide. If we're looking here on the right, it says Lake Duwamish. This is Lake Washington of today. And on the left here is Lake Union. Um, something that's not well known here in Seattle is we've got a couple of uh, inland lakes. Um, Lake Duwamish was just known as Big Water by the natives. And in 1874, uh, there was a railroad that was put in between the two lakes to haul coal um, to the ships. Uh, and so there was a a dock over here and a dock over here, and it went over to Lake Union and into Seattle. That same railroad turned into a ditch later on, and then the ship canal was put together in uh, 1816, and you'll see that the water mass changes at Lake Washington because the lake level dropped um, when they cut through. And then we have a, a new set of roads here. Uh, Lake um, University of Washington is up to the north here. Um, and then as we move further in time, uh, I have a 1936 aerial image that I'm pulling all of this other information from. Uh, and then 520 was put in and the floating bridge. And then we have the most recent changes. Uh, this big building here was Mohai Museum of History and Industry, and it was torn down. And then the new interstate was put in. And as you can see, it's a work in progress. <laughs> well, thank you. And um, then Jeff was going to show some of his work on the West Coast. Um, actually, I'm going to cheat. Uh, Richard and show a little bit of what I've been doing in Boston uh, if I could real quick um, Essentially, I've been playing around everyone knows Boston is a nice town and has um, a Waterfront that's apparently filled in there's a place called the back bay that was part of a fill-in But what I didn't realize is I started mapping and using uh, what I did here I'm going to shrink this up just a little uh, was in an effort to find base maps that I could use for editing um, with ID, I went in and found some maps that the Leventhal Map Center in Boston had. And one thing that's cool is you can do your own custom base maps as long as you have a nice XYZ. Uh, there are some other formats of uh, base layers that will work, but I haven't quite uh, deconstructed that yet. But uh, Leventhal is a great source. There are other sources for uh, base layers, including uh, some local resources that you might be able to find in your own neighborhood or the map warper. Um, but the bottom line is you can find some great old maps to trace, uh, enter them here, and then start looking at how uh, the, the, uh, the old shoreline looked and uh, do your normal OH, OSM types of tricks, add start dates and end dates. And you can see that Boston itself used to almost be a little bit of an island out on a spit uh, there, which is kind of interesting because I never, uh, I went down my tea in Boston, in uh, Cambridge, and I never realized quite how extensive the inland or uh, the uh, inland waterways were. They're just huge. So that was a nice revelation. Um, in terms of work in Seattle, um, I also, sorry, I thought I had that saved. Um, oh, and one thing I would add is just, uh, as Richard said, there are, we're missing some borders, but we do have some state borders entered. You'll start seeing some more large scale administrative boundaries. This is our worldwide rendering test bed, uh, which is, uh, Strangely enough, not actually there. Um, but this is what Seattle looked like uh, even earlier than what Nathan and Nathaniel was showing you. It used to be a very small bit of land here. 
And then I've used some of the old Sanborn fire maps, if you are familiar with those, to and some Coast Guard surveys to start showing how the city built in and went along its way. So that's about it for me. I'll step out here for each of so when all the history is in front of you on a map editor, information density can be a problem. Some of you may have started to realize this. Jossum has a filter system and you can set up start and end date to match up to particular years and that can clear things out really nicely. ID may have some filter support coming to help. None of the stuff is ideal in its current form, but it's, it's pretty usable. It, it helps clear the deck so that you can get stuff done. Uh, next slide. We experiment with tags. We do not have the OSM tagging list and we do not have tag voting. We consider ourselves to be on a learning curve about how to do historical things. We're playing with relations right now as ways of changing configurations of things over time. You know, when streets are rerouted or they change their classification or their name, there's a street relation proposal and there is the associated street relation, which is hated by many, but which gets the job mm -hmm. done. And so, you know, things like that are out there and multi polygons get used a lot for evolving areas. So next slide. Oops. Sorry. Yeah, skip. 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 <laughs> These are the ones I cut so we could get done. Okay. These, it's easier to say start date and end date. It's harder to do because when you're looking at old maps and old aerials, you're getting point in time information, which means that there's a value to external written documentation when you can get it use multiple sources to build date ranges. I'm working a lot in Albany and New York City right now. There are great steaming heaps of historic maps that allow you to get an idea of what's going on. And if you contact your local hysterical society, then there's a good chance there'll be somebody who knows what um, is what in the community you're mapping. I am absolutely expecting to reach out to the New York Historical Society in the near future to sort out some of what's going on in New York City because some of it's kind of hairy. Uh, next. Okay, so our project mindset. These tend to be long and medium term projects. You can't just drive out or look at Bing and finish it up. You got to plan on making it better as you learn more about the subject. I will start with Wikipedia sometimes, but I don't consider Wikipedia an endpoint. I follow citations in Wikipedia, verify them. Sometimes I find problems and, um, you know, if you're doing the research, you can be the one who goes back and fixes something that's wrong in Wikipedia because there's a lot. Next. So examples, this is where we're going to ask Bert to step in in a moment. A couple of military history projects kicking around. The Munin project is working on World War I field fortifications. In the American Civil War, I have been working on the Battle of Antietam and Bird has been working on Gettysburg. It's a possibility of actually being able to drive battle animations. Um, there's enough data to do that, although the exact architecture is still being kicked around. So at this point, I'd like to kick it over to Bert to show us uh, what he's done with Gettysburg. So for the Gettysburg project, this is what I've got so far. Uh, we just started doing these recently, these uh, project pages. It's an effort to revive the Open Historical Map uh, Wiki part on the, the OpenStreetMap Wiki, if you like. What we've got for Gettysburg so far is uh, what I would say about 50% done. To a basic level, we have a lot of the information here. Uh, there's still a few issues with uh, rendering. Uh, Richard has asked me to put in a ticket to get the uh, construction part of the railroad that's done in. You can see it better on the raster tile server where uh, again, it's just showing where the construction part of the railroad is. 
I started working on this three years ago, uh, specifically for the uh, state of the map US in Boulder, where I presented on what Wikiwar is. It's a project that I've been uh, working on for well, since 2008, 2009, with the idea of creating battle animations over top of maps. And when I first started, most of the work was done over top of uh, Google Earth maps, which is, of course, current maps, which doesn't help when you're trying to see stuff in 1863, like here, because when we look at the map in OpenStreetMap, we've got lots of modern artifacts like the cyclorama and things like that that just didn't exist in 1863. That was my motivation. And that's how I came to Open Historical Map, because I saw it as a way to be able to have realistic animations over time realistic maps. So if you're interested in learning more about what my motivation for doing this particular Gettysburg map was, you can, when you're looking on the State of the Map US uh, video, right around the five minute mark, I believe is where I start talking about it. And you can, it's only about three or four minutes uh, for that part of the presentation. A lot of the base maps were taken from West Point. I tried going around to a lot of different places, but West Point is where I really found the best base maps that I could actually use because they're done with modern GIS tools and I could actually get them into a format that I could easily trace and have stuff line up properly. Eventually, the goal is to create a project under the Open Historical Map Tasking Manager, which I'm the administrator for. And where I'd like to see it go is, you can notice back here on the uh, wiki page that I said it's basically about 50% done and there's a lot more detail that could go on the map. I recently read uh, the field guide to Gettysburg and in this book is a whole pile of really great detailed maps that are again done with modern GIS tools. Here you can see all kinds of fence detail that I haven't been able to find anywhere else. The challenge here is that the uh, North Carolina University Press has some strange language around whether or not you can actually use it. So if anyone has any contacts at the University of North Carolina, that would be awesome. So I can help navigate their interesting system. And that's pretty much what I have to share. Um, okay, now recently there's been a lot on diversity in OSM. So I wanted to point out some instances where diversity has already got some work done in OHM and there is potential for more. Um, yeah, I you know, hate to, volunteer my own projects, but I have mapped Seneca Village in New York City, which was a majority black neighborhood that was uh, displaced by the construction of Central Park in 1857, but was quite a vital little community for nearly 30 years. And it's become of considerable interest to archeologists recently. And then the Rapp Road Historic District here near where I live in Albany, which is a uh, a majority black community that started in the late 1930s that is still largely survived today and um, but with some disruption due to highway projects and so I have started mapping that from a 1952 aerial. Potential diversity projects I think it would be really cool if somebody would do Black Wall Street in Tulsa Oklahoma as it was before the riot. I think that would be a, a really cool thing to have in OHM maybe identify other majority minority communities of importance. And this is something that Min and I had chatted about um, in Slack, I think a week or two back. There's been some work on plotting out deed restrictions and um, that would be a pretty interesting thing that uh, open historic map would be good for mapping out. Because I can tell you that with respect to Confederate monument controversies that the monuments in Richmond, the famous ones on Monument Avenue, were actually built as an advertising come on for a whites only neighborhood being built in Richmond at the time. And that's something not many people know. Uh, next. Back one, please. Yeah. 
Okay. Um, okay. Next. Next. Okay. There we go. I was wrong. That's it. This is a map showing Seneca Village there immediately to the left of the receiving reservoir from the Croton Res Reservoir. 1850 is just right to show you interesting detail of what this part of New York City looked like before Central Park was built. And next, and we're coming to the end. Hooray. <laughs> There's the opportunity for some synthesis between OHM and OSM, something that I have mentioned in the Diversity Channel. Instead of just removing statues from OSM, put the data in OHM, and then if you can document things like start and end dates, there's data historians will find valuable to extract from something like this. That can be very instructive. It's like I said the, in the channel the other day, the statues tell you more about the people who decided to put them up, really, than they tell you about the people who they actually are representations of. And so that's good knowledge to have is who put them up, why, and when. And then finally, this last project here is my, uh, my original OHM project and still kind of my pet. So I am going to be switching over to uh, sharing screen and switching over to my uh, last little bit here. This is the Ghost Tracks project because besides mapping, and history, two things I love. I also love motor racing. And this particular map is built with a combination of data from open street map and open historic map. And this is an example of why we want to use the same tags with the same APIs and the same search engine overpass. Because this represents all of the courses that have been used at Thompson Speedway in Northern Connecticut since 1940 both the current ones that are in OSM and the ones of the past, which are in OHM. So you see here, we can change our base map to map box. Now we've got open street map. We can also toggle courses on and off and I'm gonna to toggle a bunch of them off. So what we are seeing here, let me toggle off two more. This was the original Thompson Road course of 1952, the first permanent road course built in the United States after World War II. And then this is the current Thompson Road course, the one that opened in 2014 when they brought road racing back to the track. This is the one I've actually uh, raced on. And so by going back and doing everything, you know, in that mythical right way, we can see the second road course. We can see the third road course. We can see the whole history of Thompson here and we can play with it. And not only that, but by putting the maps and the topos into uh, Map Warper, we can look at the old topographic map, the old aerial image from 1957, and we can see what things looked like back then. And so this is where I want to close by just pointing out that you need to use your imagination because there are an awful lot of things that are possible if you just kind of start thinking outside of, of the renderer because as cool as the time slider is, we can do a lot more stuff in OHM. You need to use your imagination. And I think that's it. Awesome. Nice work.